uh, our next speaker uh, goes by just D. Uh, Darian, uh, but he goes by D. He is the president and co-founder of Protect AI, uh, an exciting company about AI yeah. uh, security. You have the floor, sir. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, I want to thank the previous uh, panel because they set up our talk really, really well. Um, I'm going to take it up in altitude, probably up in attitude as well. So we'll see um, how this goes with uh, a group of academically oriented, very technically deep uh, proficient people. So I'm the co-founder of Protect AI. I'm one of three. Uh, I live in Texas. The rest of the company, though, is based in Seattle. I'll give some brief stats. Our mission is to build a safer AI-powered world. Uh, and that came about from our history. The founders and the leadership team came from all of the major clouds. I was the director of engineering for AWS's AI and machine learning uh, specialist organization. So I had over 300 engineers that were working for me about five to seven years ago. And we were building AI systems very, very, very quickly. Uh, we started the company two years ago, and now we are um, over 50 employees, closing in on 60. I approved five offers today. Side note, if anybody's looking for jobs, we are hiring. Uh, ML researchers, data scientists, ML engineers, security engineers. We only have seven people going with the other speaker. Just comment about no need for salespeople. We, ha we need a few. People still buy from people. Um, Till an LLM can issue a purchase order, I don't think we're doing that. Uh, but um, we host 12 AIML security events per year. We have three online training certificates. We established this category called ML SecOps Engineering. And now you see firms at Wells Fargo, FICO, JP Morgan Chase, Apple taking on that. We own that mantle. Um, and we've been very, very uh, blessed. And we've worked really hard to make this a thing. To make it a thing, the security of artificial intelligence systems and machine learning models, we decided to go after a community. And so here's a hint. If you're looking for a side hustle, go check out Hunter. There's 50, there's 15,000 hackers and growing very quickly. This is a bug bounty program. Our threat research report came out today. It was the largest dump by anyone of AI zero days and systems uh, today. So if you go to protectai.com backslash threat dash research, you will see our latest report and that will link you to kind of the bug bounty program. So that's the offensive side. That's what gives us the knowledge and the space and understanding to understand where AI ML systems are vulnerable uh, and how brittle they are all the way out through the models. And then MLSecOps, which is a community system, a community of researchers, academics, policymakers. We have Jen Easterly, the director of CISA in there, Martin Stanley, uh, policymakers from every state. Um, we met yesterday with the head of the United Nations AI Safety Council. Here's what I can tell you about regulators and AI. They don't understand this if you, and they couldn't spell it if you spotted them the A or the I. <laughs> so what we also do is we work with developers to prove the metal here. And we have a ton of open source tools. So if you like to build, if you like to experiment, if you wanna see what we do and how we do it, go check this out. Because what we're gonna talk about is really this. The talk originally was going to be the security of LLMs. But um, as I was listening to uh, this prior speeches, I decided to kind of change it up a little and take on a different element. So I'm going to come back to this and we're going to talk about the real risks of LLMs and how you can safeguard them. Notice my intentional word choice there. But there's an enterprise AI triad. Safety, security, and governance. There will be and is no AI in the enterprise without these three things. So when it comes to AI risk, I'm going to talk about three things. Guns, Ukraine, and beer, because I'm on a college campus. I can't leave this college campus without talking about beer and its relationship to AI. But first, the TLDR didn't read or, in this case, at a presentation, didn't listen. AI apps, the only difference between an AI application and any other piece of software is that it touches or engages a machine learning model. There's a lot of charlatans out there that try to overcomplicate it. It's not that complicated. We call ourselves Protect AI. I wonder what we do. We like to keep things simple. What that means is that a machine learning model is a new asset in a company's infrastructure, a university's infrastructure. Now, 
if you're on the Wi-Fi network right now, there's people with permissions that can spot any one of your devices, any one of your laptops, see it, know what kind it is, probably whose permissions, what it has, applications, files, everything. Do that with an AI model. You can't, right? Which means in a company's enterprise, they have hundreds, thousands of AI models inside of their enterprise that they have no idea where they are. They don't know who touched them. They don't know what they contain. But unlike any other AI, or unlike any other asset in an enterprise, it has one thing, it self-executes. So if I told you that you had assets in your infrastructure, in your enterprise, and these are assets that you have no idea who's in charge of them, what they're doing, where they sit, and they self-execute, that should sound suspiciously like a permissioned virus. And that's kind of how we think about this. And I'm going to give you a sense of what's happening in security, safety, and governance real time with real examples. And that's why I said our, our threat research report dropped today. If you want to understand kind of where that is happening, go read that. It comes out every month. And if you want a, com a comedic take on it, go check out our YouTube channel on Hunter. We have a video that we call Between Two Vulns, kind of knock on the Between Two Ferns. The, the two guys that do it are, are really comedic, but they're our head researchers. And the point of this is that security, safety, and governance are very different things. People conflate them all the time, and they're very different, and we need to start thinking about them differently because you have to, you have to go about solving them. But there is one thing that underpins them all, and we're going to talk about that. In the end, those assets and our ability to manage these systems are going to come down to three very simple but hard-to-do things. Can I see everything that's happening in the environment? Do I have full attestation and knowledge of what's happening? And can I manage and secure it? So let's talk about the problem. When we first approached this, we said, hey, we got a really good idea. We're gonna make security of AI a thing. We'd walk into every security officer and they'd say, it's not a thing. Why isn't it a thing? Because we're doing so much with code. Like we have SAS tools, DAS tools. If you're familiar with enterprise, we'd all these scanning, shift left, everybody. We're embedding security everywhere. We have million dollar firewalls. Awesome. What about your data pipeline? Ah, we have GDPR tools. We got synthetics. We're doing blah, blah, blah. Okay, but that's the problem. The problem is all of this stuff in the middle. This is an entirely separate system, an entirely separate pipeline, an entirely different set of tools. And so, the CISO, the chief security officer of a major Fortune 50 financial firm, we were sitting in front of them. They said, this isn't a thing. We have all the scanners, all the firewalls. I said, okay, let's test that. What we did was we went to their public GitHub repo. We looked at their data science repos. We pulled down those Jupyter notebooks and they were leaking hundreds of API keys back to the infrastructure. Why? Because the existing tools for code don't contextualize anything. If you give it to a J, if you give a warning to a data scientist, you say, hey, you're leaking an API key on line 3042, this JSON file. Most data scientists in the enterprise are going to go, who's JSON? Right? They don't have any idea. But if I tell them that they're leaking an API key inside of their Jupyter notebook at this particular cell, and this is a don't do, fix this in the Jupyter notebook, you'd probably do it, right? You're like, hey, you're leaking PII, personal information, API key, you've got a problem. But they weren't even doing the basics. Not that they couldn't, it's just that they didn't have the context. So context matters because this is different. And then when people think about, well, I've got a million dollar firewall, I've got a $10 million, I got a hundred million dollars of firewalls. Great. What happens is a model file is the problem. That model file has an exploit and that model file is passed around your infrastructure. You spend more time scanning PDFs and executables than you do model files. But if I downloaded a model file, I've got it on the inside, guess what? I can blow a hole out of the firewall. I've got a remote shell. I can do the credential shuffle. I can knock over anything I want. This is happening today and I'm gonna show you how. So what comes to mind when I ask anybody in this audience about describing the risk of AI? I heard things like, it's gonna eat bugs. And I had a smart ass remark. I was like, depends on the bug, right? Um, we heard end of humanity. Who wants to take, like, tell me something. Give me, give me something here. Go ahead. Misinformation campaign, that's a good one. What's the other? That's actually decent because it's not hyperbolic. 
the hyperbolic risk of it's going to end the world. There's going to be all kinds of problems. It's going to put everybody out of jobs. Like, I love the media. They have made my business. They've scared the hell out of everyone. And whoever this godfather of AI is, like, great, whatever. Um, you know, the existential threat to humanity, Jeffrey Hinton and all this stuff. It's like, okay, maybe. But there's another vice presidential candidate who once claimed to invent the internet and his career didn't last very long. That said, these aren't the biggest risks. They're not the biggest risks in the immediate future. They're probably not the biggest risks in the long-term future because we have to get to that long-term future for those things to happen. But what that is representing is a growing call for safe, regulated AI. Sound familiar? Right? You can have a safe firearm, doesn't blow up in your face. You can have a secure firearm that might blow up in your say in your face, but if it's in a locked box and nobody can get to it, probably not going to. And ask yourself who governs firearms. It's broken. There is none, right? Like we we still as a country debate this left, right, courts up and down, every jurisdiction are battling this. That is what is going to continue to happen with AI. Except when the right and the left are both getting together on something, it's probably gonna happen. They can't agree on who's gonna be speaker this week, but they can sure agree on regulating AI, right? This is us in December. This is our CEO, my co-founder on the right with his back to you, testifying before what I like to say is the last working bipartisan committee on the Hill. This is Chairman Gambarino's committee uh, and the uh, co-chair of that, uh, the ranking minority members, Eric Swal. It was a very good committee, and we have spent most of our time now on the Hill with other government regulations and state regulators across the space talking about AI regulation. In 2022, there were five states that had specific AI regulations on their books. By 2023, there were 24 of them. Now there are 44. Number one industry that states are regulating with AI, insurance. Right? Something to think about. But we're not the only one, we're late to the game. NIST has come up with stuff, OWASP has stuff, MITRE, but the EU AI Safety Act, you mentioned the GDPR component in the back. This is an interesting construct, right? Because how they're thinking about GDPR and how they're thinking about AI safety today are very different things. I'll actually come back to that because safety, security, and governance are all different, but they're interconnected, right? And we had to pick a starting point. Where did we think we were going to go if we want to build a safer AI-powered world? Because you have to think about all of the risks. The risks are technical in nature. They're operational because this is a dual-use technology. There are regulatory, more and more coming every day. An interesting fun fact, the FDA regulates AI and ML with no existing congressional authority. You know how they do it? They treat AI and ML models as medical devices, right? Federal Reserve in 2007, they had to find a little bit of a financial crisis. By 2011, they created a regulation for every bank called the Model Risk Regulation, Model Risk Assessment. What they meant was financial models, right? The capital formation of the bank. But now every one of those things isn't signed by a John or a Jane Smith. It's signed and created by a machine learning algorithm that predicts how much capital a bank needs to have in order to be solvent within that compliance. And so now those chief model risk officers have some of the biggest ML teams, biggest data science team, and they have to report to the Fed all the time on that. That's a big portion of our business. And then, of course, reputational harm. When you have an AI gone wrong or a bot's gone crazy issue or data leakage or whatever the case may be. And this is where it's vulnerable. It's vulnerable because A, the systems are different, the tools don't exist, and the governance frameworks don't make much sense. In the end, I'm not going to go over each one of these, but what I will say is that there are more threats with AI because there's more abstraction. There's, there's hidden things that you can't see. And all those systems that are interconnected, you can't actually get together. But there's also more privileges. Data scientists and ML engineers 
have the highest level of rights, roles, and privileges in an enterprise on an enterprise system. Why? Because for your models to get better, you have to have more access to more live data. You have to have more access to more live systems. So if I socially engineer a web API developer, they've got a sandbox, I knock them over, not such a big deal. If I get the credentials of your top data scientist, very big deal. And that's what's happening. Our most popular talk that is requested by everybody is a talk, and you can find it on YouTube called I Hunt AI Engineers. It's about socially engineering a data scientist. And I'll walk you through how we do that. But the AI vulnerability spectrum is really interesting because what a lot of people are focused on is really what happens at the model, right? Hey, I don't want the model to do things that it shouldn't. I don't want it to say things that it shouldn't. And I love it when the industry uses the term hallucination, commonly referred to in the past as a mistake. If you want to test this out, Whoever you're in a relationship with, the next time you get in an argument and they accuse you of something, just say, hey, it was just a hallucination. Watch what happens. It's a really fun example. I've tried that myself. But the reality is that the model input, that there's a blind between that model input and the model file, right? And that is where you start talking about a perimeter. A perimeter is something you have to defend, something you have to monitor, something you have to manage and maintain. But really what's happening is that the bigger issue is in the model files themselves, because again, those model files are hidden in an infrastructure. They can do a lot of things and a lot of people can touch them and nobody sees where they are, what they're doing, what they're made of, what the lineage is, all kinds of problems. I could tell you everything about an iPhone that gets onto my network. It's really hard to tell you about an AI application and what happened with its model, its data set, its users, and its pipelines. But we have to be able to solve that. So the model file and supply chain are the areas that are most brittle. And that's where the most insecurity occurs because security is the foundation for safety. Ask Ukraine, right? Ukraine's an interesting thing, not only just because uh, they've got all kinds of claims that this is the first AI powered or AI uh, threat theater, or AI conflict where AI is actually being used. I wonder how many times I can use AI in that sentence. But the reality is this, there's a nasty economics of asymmetry and safety and security are asymmetrical. So Russia decides to source cheap drones, right? A Shahed 136 drone costs about $50,000. There's over 10,000 of them in theater, right? The Patriot interceptor missile is $4 million per missile. There's only about 1,000 of them in theater. They were firing them so fast that the U.S. Defense Department had to say, slow down, you're going to run out. We're literally using million-dollar missiles to shoot down $1,000 drones. This is a lesson in volume economics. They can kill, literally. And that is the paradox of how people think about adversarial machine learning threats. When we first started the company two years ago, we thought that adversarial machine learning was going to be the big thing. I remember trying to recruit Jay, being like, hey, I'm going to go do this adversarial thing. He had a bunch of blogs that I thought were really cool. That's how I came across meeting Jay uh, from his material on adversarial machine learning. And the more we went down, the more we realized this is a dumb economic thing. No hacker other than a few state actors are gonna throw a million dollar GPU cluster at a problem when it's a whole lot easier to hijack the data scientist's credentials, do the credential shuffle, get to the model registry, download the, all the models, download the weights and the biases of the feature store and walk out with the training data set that's unencrypted. Why throw a million dollar GPU cluster at something to trick it when I can just hijack it? So we very quickly pivoted and said, where is the big problem? Because hacking in the real world doesn't work with a bunch of people who fly in and these superpowers and are doing all this. And this is kind of a little bit of a trope, but I actually think it's how people think hacking works, where like somebody comes in and says, hey, we've breached the walls of the CIA and figure this out. In reality, what happens is somebody just found a file, leaked a bunch of stuff on Smash Mouth message board. And somebody's like, cool, let's just spray them across Venmo and see what happens because people don't change their passwords. The simplicity of the attacks are what is happening. And that's essentially what's happened in the real world. So in the real world, the way this works is, hey, machine learning engineers, data scientists, and others like to be very, very helpful. They like to work together and collaborate. But here's the thing. 
When they do that, they can hijack things. People don't pay attention. You click on a link, you pass the shell. You, here's the model. I can't get it to work. It goes to URL. Boom. I've got a reverse shell. Once I'm inside your network, I punch a hole out. I've got you. This is the problem. We tried showing this to the maintainers array. They said, it's not a problem. We we're like, oh yeah? Yes, it is. This is the first coordinated foreign actor attack on a very popular AI system it's called the Shadow Ray team, right? It was us and Oligo Security. We worked together to kind of track this down and figure it out. Wonderful team, group out of Israel, a researcher of ours. And it was originally found, this bug was originally sourced on Hunter. But this is about the tip of the iceberg because there is an AI centric solar winds and log 4J problem coming in. If you're not familiar with those, it's okay, but basically I'll make a long story short. SolarWinds was a critical supplier to almost every U.S. federal government agency. The Russians were able to plant code. Then they had the largest breach in espionage history of a cybersecurity system. And that is being cleaned up today. That's the one that we know about. Log4j was another problem. It was essentially a permission issue that was set inside of the core element of Java and is spread all over the place. And Nobody can really find out if this has actually been cleaned up or not, which means that vulnerability still exists. So going back to my comment around, you have to be able to see and know and manage where things are. If you can't go and say, show me everywhere where an XG boost model is being used at inference. And that XG boost model has a backdoor or a problem or something that's happening in inference, I can launch the attack. I can launch the exploit very quickly. And if you can't spot where it is, You've got a problem. And even if you could spot where it is over time, you've got a second problem. That's economics. Unlike a laptop where I can force update, I can create that, I can patch it, I can take it off the network, I can do whatever. You're basically left with two options in ML models today. Shut it down, probably not good, or retrain it, very expensive, right? That's the only way you can reconstruct it. So we need to start focusing on practical security, safety, and governance. And we know how to do this very smartly. We do it all the time with molecules, right? We reduce risk in molecules all the time from toothpaste to beer. Beer is everyone's favorite set of molecules. One of my most fun customers is a small Texas brewery, probably why they're so fun, that uses generative AI and LLMs to make new recipes and get them to market very, very quickly, right? It's a pretty cool thing, right? You think about it, you, and, and he did it himself. He's a builder. So George goes and he puts it on his own Mac and he uh, you know, gave it some training set recipes, aggregated a bunch of things, did some really cool stuff. And he was like, how can I put this into production? And what he was mirroring was in Silico Pharmaceuticals, another customer of ours. And Silico Pharmaceuticals was the very first company to ever find a drug that was completely generated by AI. But what was even more interesting was that it found the molecular interchange and the molecular structure of what to target using AI too. It's a very rare form of cystic fibrosis. And what they did was they basically took all of these things in the pink, which I don't know if you can see, but like where it says perception, learning, memory, cognition, execution. These are the things that are on the G to P, genes to phenotype relationship in biotechnology, which is one of the reasons I'm going to bring this up is because this is the danger zone that everybody's worried about in terms of security, safety, and governance of generative AI in biotechnology. But these spots, these steps are essentially where they decided to try to facilitate the human machine interaction. Could the LLM help? And so what it did was they put custom LLMs at each one of those components where you have a new target molecule, a manual recuration, the manual designs of the molecular structure. And they said, hey, what we're going to do is we're going to feed it all of the protein structures. Why is this so perfectly built for an LLM? Because when you're talking about the genome, it's a sequence of letters, G, A, C, T, blah, 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 whatever. I'm not a biotechnologist, but it's a perfectly suited structure. The genome is for LLMs, right? Then it created a chemical dendiogram on the right in picture B, matched those things up and said, hey, here's the most optimal sets of things that can go and battle one another. But that same system is the exact same system that the Netflix team did, which is what people up here were talking about prior. So the same people that could come back, use this system to make a drug, 
that inside actor could also be using that same system to create a whole bunch of chaos. So when we talk about operational risks and operational controls, it's about the dual use. Who is using the model? What are they doing with it? How do I regulate it? And the more you put Gen AI into production, the more you have to be thinking about this, particularly if you have to answer a question and you're not going to want to say, I do not recall, Senator. That's a problem. This is what we call intentionally bad, right? This is an intentionally bad situation, which is partly why, again, the right and the left, a blue senator from Massachusetts, yep, a blue senator from Massachusetts, a red senator from North Carolina, getting together to try to figure out how to govern this. But this is accidental bad. This is somebody who actually deployed a chatbot into their recipe planner. That recipe planner very, very simply just said, oh, here's a wonderful aromatic water recipe. It's chlorine gas. That's not a really good outcome, which makes you wonder what if your beer started producing cyanide, right? Either by accident because you trained it and it didn't know, it wasn't trying to do it on purpose, or a bad actor decides to pollute the supply chain all the way upstream. So we tell businesses all the time, if you have AI deployed today, you're vulnerable today. And most people say, we don't have AI. We're not doing open AI yet. It's like, mm, do you work in an insurance company? Cool. Do you do document processing? Yes. Then you have AI deployed. And they're, oh yeah, maybe I do. So we do have a great example on how to think about this, to manage smartly and manage those real risks smartly and effectively. And that example is the FDA. The FDA actually does a pretty good job of thinking about it when anybody who's had a telemedicine appointment and you have to get a, an antibiotic for a sinus infection or something, you know what's interesting about that? From the minute you make that request to see a medical professional all the way through to the farm tech that's filling your prescription, somebody is signing their name to something. There's all kinds of attestation there. There is nothing on the data scientist, though, that creates that model to determine the prediction of what should be done. So security, safety, and governance, we believe, is achieved with MLSecOps. And this is the key to unlocking a safer AI-powered world. And the way that we do that, in particular for LLMs, is through a product we call Layer. Layer is built off of an open source tool that if you're interested in how this works, go take this. Because LLM adoption is top of mind. So this was all a bit of a pivot in the talk based off of what we heard earlier, because I wanted to give you something to think about. But there's basically four ways LLMs are being deployed today. Enterprise employees, proprietary employee, meaning I've got my own set of things that I've made for myself, proprietary customer LLMs, which are things that end users can engage in, and shadowing consumer LLMs, which means we're going to ban it. And it's like, nice try, right? So this is the most common LLM architecture pattern. And if you're interested, find me afterwards. I'll detail this for you. This is all to get to the point to say, hey, we know what kind of problems are here. But the reality is that there are very brittle breakage points of where security and safety go hand in hand. And if you don't fix these things or address these things, you have a big problem. And so we believe that the best place to start is to actually start with that little yellow box, monitor the prompts and responses, and gate them before they get to the LLM, because it's kind of like a bullet out of a gun. Once it's fired, you can't put it back in, right? So you need to start thinking about it. Spoiler alert, if you go to LLM-Guard, we're very prescriptive on what we do, it's an open source tool. And what you'll notice is we do not use LLMs to guard LLMs. We think that's stupid. It's also very expensive. What we use are very small transformer models that have much more deterministic capabilities that make it more capable, more performant, and spoiler alert, cheaper because you can do it on an ARM core and not an NVIDIA GPU, even the Texas size GPU cluster. Congratulations on that. So if you wanna try that out, go to llm-guard.com. You can download this, see 31 output scanners, 31 input scanners. You can see the published latencies. It's pretty easy. It's free. Go play with it and put it in front of an LLM application and see how it, uses, uh, how it does. And last, what I'm going to leave you with is this. You want to earn some money on the side? Go to Hunter. Start banging away at bugs, LLM prompt injections, all kinds of things. We uh, One guy made over $200,000 in about two months. Uh, he was 20 years old. We actually had to do a KYC on him. Um, MLSecOps, if you want to understand as a practitioner level, professional policy advisors, there's a great Slack channel in there, growing leaps and bounds, a lot of fun. And if you want to experiment, get on with GitHub and we'll take a look at that. And so I want to say thank you. I hope this was a good presentation for you.
Okay, we have uh, some time for questions. That boring. All right. Okay. I guess. Uh, yeah, I guess I can. Go ahead. I, I wanted to ask you. I think one aspect of the chatbot security that uh, I wanted to understand is people are afraid about their uh, LLM having some corner case. Uh, mm -hmm. That's why they do the red teaming. Yeah. And uh, you said that having another LLM that does the red teaming is going to be expensive. Uh, I guess, what are the alternatives? Well, there's red teaming you... and there's guarding, right? So what we don't think makes sense is you can employ LLMs to kind of do agency to agent to agent. Um, let, let, let me clarify. Right? Yeah. Red teaming, the way I understand it is, let's say Bank of America is going to deploy a chatbot, right? Right. Before they deploy it publicly, they deploy it internally and they hire five people and the five people start asking questions trying to make it disclose social security yeah, numbers. Yeah, so it's, I, the way I understand it is that you have the LLM, you're, you have people actively trying to yeah. mess with it. So that's what, that's what I, that's what I yeah. understand. So what's the alternative that, that you that's, have to that's a portion of it, right? So it's an, and it's not an, or, so I think what you have to do is you have to understand the architecture of where those LLMs are deployed much more. You need to be more worried about that than you do about the corner case, because you ha again, the attacks or the risk of data leakage is really dependent upon what's happening. What you'll notice is that the more private LLMs are actually getting very good at preventing those corner cases from being exploited. Um, and contrary to the monopoly view, it's been actually really interesting to see the explosion of the number of LLMs and private companies and open source companies that are actually being used. It's not, it's expanding, it's not contracting, but every one of those models is getting better at kind of managing the corner case, which we would consider red teaming that way is much more about red teaming, more like a social engineering of an LLM. Can you confuse it? Can you get it to divulge something it shouldn't? Uh, we just call it red teaming because I think it's an easier way to sell it. But the reality is, is that it's more like social engineering, whereas more classic red teaming would be making sure that you understand the permission controls, that you understand the perimeters, you have different escalation privileges that you've locked down, that maybe you have some WAF elements that you've kind of managed and manipulated to make sure that the, the calls are, are consistent and the time the times on the response are okay. Very good, very good. Yeah. Any other questions, perhaps? Uh, yes, D, I actually have a question. Uh, <laughs> Go. So we're all familiar, I think, within the open source community, the software, bill of materials. Yeah. Could you talk briefly about what you guys are doing with the sure. uh, ML bomb or? Uh, yeah, that? so we believe that an ML or AI bill of materials is the basic foundational building block for AI safety, security, and governance, because it does three things. It gives you full provenance of a model. It tells you everything about it, including the data set, all the lineage, and we version those things. So if anybody in here has used git diff in their code, the way our tool works is that it's essentially a git diff for the entire AI environment. Why is that beneficial? One, it tells anybody who needs to ask who touched what, when, where. It gives kind of all those interconnection couplings. But the other thing that it does is it really helps with repeatability and explainability. Because we like to think about software as a deterministic thing, and it largely is. But when you're talking about AI, it's probabilistic in its behaviors, right? So I, I equate it to raising a toddler, and we call it the four Fs. If I could go back, if you are sitting in a plane or you see a, a restaurant, a toddler's throwing a temper tantrum, the four Fs are feces, did, did, did you need to change the diaper, food, is it hungry, fever, or is it just F it, I'm a human and I'm going to do something crazy and I can't recreate that. If I can go back in time, though, and solve those three things, I can then limit that and narrow that probabilistic output. So it's really big in terms of explainability. Um, it's really big in terms of repeatability and auditability. That is among the most important things. And an, a traditional SBOM does not include all the things necessary that you would need for a machine learning model or all the things that you would need to include the data pipelines around it. Very good. Any other questions? There you go. Oh, yeah. right. Jealous of your haircut. Got it. So you made a pretty clear case that you are for governance in AI, but I feel like uh, you're shaking your head. So maybe this is more of a interesting <laughs> question. Uh, well, I, what I wanted to ask you is yeah. where do you see the government government's role in governing AI 
what sort of regulations would you like to see in place and to whom would they apply? Yeah, it's going to be really hard for me to say what kind of things would I like to say. Again, I, I would be all for it if there are people that were um, governing it understood it, but they don't, right? Um, but that's why I think the FDA is kind of an interesting model. Is it perfect? No. Is it a political hot button? Sure. But the reality is they do a really good job of understanding everything from drug safety of what can be done, how a protocol is built for drug testing, who can distribute it, securing the the supply chain and the chain of custody of getting the drug safely from a manufacturer all the way into your body, right down to disclosing. When you think about it, I mean, most of us get a prescription for an antibiotic, we throw the thing away, but there's a lot of useful information in kind of what the pharmacist is even giving you, right? Because AI has got to, in, in a lot of ways, we've got to think about the governance of that. And I loved how you framed the question because there's different checkpoints and different components of people who are going to have different levels of responsibility, right? So I don't have a perfect answer. What I would say is there's not a lot of people at the FDA who don't have a background in science. There's not a lot of people at the FDA and the administration who haven't served in healthcare or don't have a medical degree or don't have some formalized training. And yet, we got people thinking about space lasers talking about governance of AI. Like that's probably a bad idea, right? The reality is we need to educate those who can do that and do it smartly. I do think though that this notion of, uh, for example, the White House executive order came out. And the number one thing that it had in terms of security was really related to flops, which I, uh, floating point operations per second, right? I think that's a red herring in terms of thinking about safety and security, because once those small models are out, I actually, we actually agree with kind of Sebastian's view, small models will take over the world, not big ones. And they're gonna be very functionally specific. We see that every day. Those things don't need a supercomputer to run. Thank you. Yeah. Very good. Uh, one more question. Okay, the last one. Uh, so, because you deal with businesses in this environment, how would you- Number one customer, by the way, is governments. Uh-huh, okay. Well, I was wondering if you could answer this. Um, what kind of attitude do you see in businesses with regards to protecting their AI assets? And if it's nonchalant, mm -hmm. does that pose a, a threat to their uh, stewardship of consumer data? That's a really great question. What I would say to you is um, if, if they've been through a data breach and they don't have AI at all, they are really concerned about it, which means almost everybody is. Uh, so the, the consumer data component is actually the thing that everybody's really, really concerned about. I have yet to find anyone that's um, not concerned about that. Where it gets interesting, though, is around all that other stuff in the purple. Right. Because an ML model to work has to have more than just that consumer data component. In a lot of cases, I'll give you an example. One of the biggest fast food restaurants in the world is a customer of ours. And they wanted to talk to us a lot about the security of LLMs that they wanted to put in their menu ordering uh, app. Right. And they were really concerned about that. What they didn't realize, well, and we found this through discovery, was that every single location had cameras that were used in place to measure protein consumption, right? Because that's the single biggest cost they have and labor, right, to watch the people. But what they didn't realize was that that model was tied to personally identifiable information about the employee. That's a different problem. So it's not that they don't want to solve it. They just don't think about it yet. So once you start thinking about the personally identifiable information of your employees that are coming in and working that floor, it's a very different situation. Everybody worries about customer data, but when you start putting models in place that are monitoring employee data, you have to really take that seriously. And, and they want to, they just don't think of it. Okay. Uh, uh, let's uh, thank Dee. Thanks, guys. Thank you.